The Ohio Supreme Court ruled Thursday, that would be last week, that firing warning shots can be considered self-defense. I don't know why they have scare quotes around it. Giving a win to gun rights activists advocates. But the Second Amendment supporters were surprised to learn that the decision was made by three liberal justices and one conservative. During an altercation at a gas station in 2021, Tyler Wilson fired a warning shot at Billy Reffitt's car, claiming he was acting in self-defense. Wilson claims Reffitt threatened him and pulled a gun on him. But a Clark County judge, this would be a trial judge, said Wilson wasn't protecting himself because he didn't aim the gun at the supposed assailant. So the judge didn't allow him to argue self-defense in court, seemingly saying that if Wilson was really scared for his life, he would have shot Refer. So the issue here is the trial judge is coming to a conclusion that as a matter of law, warning shots cannot be self-defense. To put it another way, he's saying, well, based on what you're claiming to be the facts, defense, even if we believe everything you're saying is true, you haven't met your burden of production for self-defense. Now, once, once self-defense is allowed to be argued in court, it's admitted as a legal defense by the judge, then the burden of proof on self-defense is on the state to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, this is true in Ohio, like every other state, although it's only recently true in Ohio. Uh, before, let's see, before March 28th, 2019, so only about five years ago, uh, Ohio was the last state in the country to still put the burden of persuasion, the burden of persuading the jury of the truth or falsity of self-defense, put that burden on the defendant. The defendant in Ohio had to prove self-defense by a preponderance of the evidence, as opposed to the rule in 49 other states that the state had to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. This meant that two self-defense cases, essentially identical facts, could be an easy acquittal in 49 states and an easy conviction in Ohio. Now, this is kind of a legal history legacy of Ohio. It used to be fairly common to put the burden of self-defense on the defendant to prove it by a preponderance of the evidence. Over the last 100 years or so, every state except Ohio had changed that to put the burden of persuasion onto the states beyond a reasonable doubt. And Ohio was simply the last state to adopt that position. But it did do that about five years ago. And that certainly covers the time of this event. Let's see. Oh, but before you get to the burden of persuasion in court, you have to get self-defense admitted, permitted as a legal defense in the first place. You're not automatically entitled to argue self-defense in front of a jury you have to convince the judge that you first have met what's called your burden of production. The burden of production precedes the burden of persuasion. The burden of production is a burden on the defense to show that there's evidence to support whatever legal defense they want to raise. In this case, the legal defense is self-defense. Self-defense, of course, has distinct elements, up to five elements of a claim of self-defense. And all the required elements are obviously required. If any one of the required elements is missing, whatever your use of force was, it cannot have been lawful self-defense because you're missing a required element of lawful self-defense. So you can be tasked, challenged by the prosecutor or the court to show some minimal amount of evidence in support of each of the required elements. Because if there's zero evidence on any required element, you don't have self-defense, as strictly as a technical matter of law. Here, the trial judge is saying, well, even if we believe everything the defense is saying, we presume that what they're saying is true, they still have not met their burden of production on self-defense, and therefore, I'm not going to allow the defense to argue self-defense to this jury. The jury will never hear the word self-defense said in the courtroom. This is very... Well, I was going to say it's unusual. It's unusual for good guy cases of self-defense. Bad guy cases of self-defense, this happens to all the time because just on the obvious facts, they're, they're missing a required element of self-defense. Normally, judges bend over backwards to allow the defense. In part, what they'll do is they'll say, all right, well, we're going into the trial. It doesn't look to me, the trial judge might say, it doesn't look to me like you really met your burden of production on self-defense. But the trial may develop new evidence, right? Witnesses may say something surprising when they're subject to direct and cross-examination. So I'll let you argue self-defense during the course of the trial, but before 
we finalize the jury instructions. I'm going to reevaluate. And you better have met your burden of production by the end of the trial proper, or you will not get that self-defense jury instruction. Which is awkward because, well, first of all, of course, without a self-defense jury instruction, the jury can't acquit on self-defense. It's simply not an option before them. But also, it's kind of weird to be arguing self-defense an entire trial and then not get the jury instruction. The jury doesn't get to consider self-defense. Uh, it's just missing. So that's what the judge is saying here. You haven't met your burden of production. This is in self-defense as a technical legal matter, even if I believe everything you're saying is true. So I'm not going to allow you to argue self-defense in court, and the jury is not going to get that jury instruction. And importantly, his defense attorney didn't fight back for him. So the defense attorney didn't argue this decision by the judge. This, as we will see when we look at the uh, court opinion, this is the rare case in which on appeal, the defendant at trial and now the appellant on appeal argues ineffective assistance of counsel. And, and the, the Ohio Supreme Court here says, yeah, you're right. <laughs> your, your lawyer was constitutionally defective in his representation. Very rare that ineffective assistance of counsel is one of the most common claims on appeal because everyone who's been convicted at trial thinks it has to be because their lawyer sucked. But it's, it's such a uh, low burden to be qualified as effect, effective at trial that you almost never see uh, an appellate court agreeing that the, the trial attorney was ineffective. Because normally there's a, a strategy reason for why an attorney did or didn't do something. Uh, there may be you know, four legal defenses a defense attorney could argue, but they're inconsistent with each other. So he has to pick one. That means he didn't argue the other three. Is that ineffective assistance of counsel or did he just make a strategic decision? like any good lawyer would do. So here we have an unusual case of an actual ineffective assistance of counsel claim that worked. So continuing, Wilson, Tyler Wilson, the defendant was acquitted of attempted murder, but was found guilty of felonious assault. So assault, of course, is putting someone in fear of imminent unlawful harm. Uh, felonious here because it involved the gun. He was sentenced to more than a decade in prison. He appealed his conviction. But what do I always caution? Appeals are for losers, right? First of all, it meant you're only appealing because you lost at trial. If you'd won a trial, it would be an acquittal. There'd be nothing to appeal. Um, but also, when you do appeal, the prospects of getting meaningful relief is less than 1%. And usually, meaningful relief just, just means a new trial. But even that is less than 1%. And at the first intermediary level of appeals here, so in Ohio, you have trial courts, mid-level appeals courts, and then the Ohio Supreme Court. At the mid-level appellate courts here, the Second District Court of Appeals agreed with the trial court. Three-judge panel, two-to-one decision, and it denied Wilson's request on appeal to overturn his conviction. He also argued, of course, that his attorney was ineffective. Um, the Buckeye Firearms Association's Rob Sexton, this would be a, a Second Amendment ad advocacy group in Ohio, believes these rulings are unconstitutional. Uh, he says this... Second Amendment advocate, quote, if you're in fear for your life or trying to protect yourself or other loved ones from harm, that's a warning shot, that a warning shot can be an element of self-defense, he argues. The Ohio Supreme Court agreed and just overruled the trial judge and, by extension, the, the mid-level appellate court that had ruled against Wilson. The Ohio Supreme Court was split in a 4-3 decision saying that warning shots can be considered self-defense, even if you aren't trying to kill or injure someone. Uh, the Second Amendment advocate was surprised when he read the opinion, not because of the ruling, but because of who made it. Knowing that the high court has agreed with that, that warning shots can be self-defense, even those on the high court that you would typically assume would not be necessarily pro-Second Amendment makes a stronger case for future self-defense claims. Now, I will say Mr. Sexton here is conflating two different areas of the law, uh, Second Amendment law and self-defense law. They're, they're not the same things. A self-defense law would exist and apply even if guns didn't exist. Um, Second Amendment law exists independent of self-defense. Uh, of course, there is an overlap, at least in America, where guns are commonly owned for purposes of self-defense, but really two different things. Um, a judge might be completely anti-Second Amendment for whatever reason and very pro-self-defense or the reverse. Continuing, the court is 
Republican leaning, but it was the three liberal justices and one conservative who asserted that Ohio's laws only require the intent to repel or escape force. All agreed, <laughs> the entire Ohio Supreme Court agreed that counsel was ineffective. Uh, Justice Melody Stewart wrote the opinion. Justices Michael Donnelly, Jennifer Bruner joined. Justice Pat Fisher, the lone Republican, concurred in judgment only. So he didn't concur with the argument of the other three justices, meaning he agreed with the result but neglected to write an opinion on why. While this ruling seems to expand gun rights, Case Western Reserve University law professor Jonathan Enton explained that this case isn't really about guns. Well, that that is correct. It's more a question of how easily should it be to assert self-defense. The court didn't say that this particular defendant had acted in self-defense, but only that the jury should have been allowed to consider whether he did. So if the question is, has the Ohio Supreme Court said that warning shots are okay? The answer is no, any more than the Ohio Supreme Court saying it's okay to shoot someone. It's okay to shoot someone if you do it within the legal boundaries of self-defense. And if you shoot someone and claim you were within the legal boundaries and you meet your burden of production, then you should be able to argue self-defense to a jury. What this trial court had said, and the, the mid-level appellate courts agreed, was that if you fire a warning shot and you claim it was self-defense, you should not be allowed to argue self-defense to the jury as a justification for the warning shots. As a matter of law, warning shots cannot be justified as lawful self-defense. That's what the Ohio Supreme Court is reversing but you'd still have to make the argument at court. They're just saying you're allowed to make the argument that the warning shot was self-defense. The argument's not taken off the table as a matter of law, but you will have to make the argument. And it's quite possible a finder of fact might conclude, a jury might conclude that your, your particular warning shots were not in fact justified as lawful self-defense because you're missing one or more elements of lawful self-defense.